WOTW HD2 Windermere. Bud 94.1. From the attorneys Justin Clark and Associates, you have Power.com Studios. This is Behind the Law with attorney Justin Clark. And welcome to the program, and thank you for joining me for another edition of Behind the Law with me, attorney Justin Clark. Thank you for spending some of your weekend here with me on our favorite radio station, Bud 94.1. We're here to answer any legal question that you may have. Anything from accident to zoning, dial up the phones, 321 282 one zero five five. Plenty of information on the website www.youhavepower.com. You can watch this show live or any other show on Facebook or any social media platform at ATTY Justin Clark. Three two one two eight two one zero five five. You have power. Dot com. Joining me as always to my right here in the Bud ninety four one studio is Orlando. Radio legend Mick Dolan. Mick, what's up, buddy? How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Thank you for spending another uh, another hour with me. I always appreciate it. You know, the show just wouldn't be the same without you. Well, I mean, what would we do? What well, would I talk would about? Go, I would be. Like, it would be like walking in the studio naked. Really, it would probably go a lot faster. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> you about know, that. I mean, serious. And pushing the buttons, making sure we go on the air from next door. Our sister station, 103.1 The Wolf. It's Skid. He's the afternoon guy. What's up, Skid? I am doing fabulous, sir. Thanks, Jason. pal. Thanks for thanks for being here. Well, thank you. Thanks you always brighten my week when I see you. <laughs> That's what kind of week he's had. Uh, yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's miserable, oh, miserable, really? miserable, miserable, miserable. <laughs> Great. Had to been a horrible week. Three, two, one, two, eight, two, one, zero, five, five. You know, it struck me the other day that we we talk about a bunch of legal things on the show, but we oftentimes circle back around to homeowners associations. Those conversations don't always go well. You know, homeowners associations are one of these. You, you love Bad them, guys. you need them, and then you fight with them, and then it's it's also this weird dichotomy of these are our neighbors, but then we're also sort of having a fight with them, and. and I've always told you, we've talked about foreclosure a million times, Mick, on this show. And I always say, look, if the bank files foreclosure against you, if you hire a lawyer, you're probably going to get a year or two. I mean, it's just a no-brainer. Any sort of lawyer worth anything can get you a year or two defending that foreclosure because these banks typically hire big foreclosure mill law firms with a ton of files on their desk. But what if I told you? When an HOA comes to foreclose on you. Because I made it clear to you, if you haven't paid your HOA dues, the Homeowners Association can come foreclose on you and take your home just like the bank can. You know, you owe them 100 bucks; They can come take your house. But these Homeowners Associations do not hire foreclosure mill law firms. They hire very, very talented local law firms that really specialize in HOA law. And they can come take your house way faster than a bank can. That's just the reality of the situation. Really? And one of those HOA lawyers, and in my opinion, the best homeowners association lawyer in town is a man named Frank Ruggieri. And he joins me today. Frank, welcome to the program. Thanks for coming in. How are you? Well, good morning, Justin. I'm not sure how I'm going how, how to justify that introduction. I'll, I'll do my best. Well, he's, uh, he's the owner and founder of the, the Ruggieri firm. And the first question I have for you, and we have a lot of politicians on this show, and especially people running for politics. And I always comes to me, I'm like, okay, so you worked all day. And then you've got to go to these stupid events at the chamber every single night, Monday through Friday, go hand out signs or go stand on the corner twirling your little vote for me sign. As an HOA attorney, do you find yourself having to go to these stupid HOA meetings several times a week or no? Oh, regularly, yes. Yeah? yeah so, no, I mean, you work all day and then you've got to go to these meetings at night as well, huh? Well, usually what I'll do, just I may take a break during the day if I've got a very late meeting. No, I'm just kidding. It's just just a regular part of what we do. You know, I right. mean, it's it's uh, if you're going to get into this and you're going to represent community associations, hey, the board's getting together. You know, the homeowners are uh, are, are taking time out of their their busy days. Uh, the board members have full time jobs, families, many of them. So hey, if they can do it, why can't I? I guess so. It's just it's a lot of work. I mean, there's no doubt having to go to these board meetings is a lot of work. It, you know, it takes some some mental fortitude as well. I imagine getting through some of these meetings. But all right, homeowners associations like little mini governments, very very powerful boards. There's no doubt about it. Anytime, if any of you have ever had a fight with a homeowners association, you know how powerful they can be. Who gives the homeowners association their rights? Is this a statutory thing? Is it in the constitution? I mean, where does it, where do the HOAs really get their power from? Well, primarily, um, I think community associations have essentially evolved, and especially here in the state of Florida, where, where uh, by our very nature, we've got smaller government. Um, to me, community associations are effectively an extension kind of of local government. They fill needs uh, that local government can't fill or that they don't fill, uh, maintaining common areas within the community. 
Um, but primarily where they get their, their authority from, if you will, is the, the, the governing documents, what's referred to as the governing documents for the community. That would include the restrictive covenants, maybe what most people might refer to as deed restrictions, um, and then also the Articles of Incorporation and Bylaws for the Community Association itself. And all right, so a lot of people out there, maybe you uh, you retired, and you're like, well, you know, I really want to make the grass greener in my neighborhood. Maybe I'll run for the board. Is there a, a certain liability if someone wants to become a board member? I mean, let's say that the board really upsets me. I'm a homeowner. I'm going to sue them. Can a board member actually be liable for lawsuits in this situation? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, now, what, what I always remind my board members, um, and I teach board member certification classes, I've been doing it for 20 years. Um, and what I always tell my board members is, look, if you follow a couple of simple rules, you really don't need to be concerned about personal or individual liability because a homeowners association is a corporation. And just like any other corporation, those directors are, are protected, uh, to a great extent by that, that corporate shell, if you will. Uh, so they enjoy that protection like any other corporation would. Uh, but you can face personal liability as a board member if you, uh, act, uh, in a way that's, uh, you know. Uh, for, so, for example, self-dealing, doing things like that where you might be benefiting yourself inappropriately, that could, uh, uh, that could, could lead to some issues there. But so it, it's not a really common thing. You really have to kind of do something pretty bad to, to expose yourself to that kind of liability. I hear that all the time. People will come in my office and say, look, I don't know. I'm paying $500 a month for this HOA, and I just think they're stealing the money. You must hear that sometimes, or you must hear these <laughs> accusations sometimes. Have you ever seen a real case where a board member was actually stealing money? Um, not a board member per se, and certainly I don't know the outcome of the situation, yeah. but I was involved in a particular community here in Central Florida where um, uh, some of the players involved in the development of the community were actually charged criminally with embezzling funds from the community association. What rights do the other homeowner? Let's say the homeowner does have suspicions about this board, and, and their suspicions maybe are, are valid, okay? What rights do they have to request to, to actually see the books or see what's going on financially with that board no, that's or great, the HOA? That's a great question, and, and, and really that question leads to kind of the, the main check and balance, if you will, that, that – uh, I believe exists for for every homeowner residing in a in a community with a community association. That is, hey, ask to look at the official records. Ask ask to look at the records uh, that are required by statute to be maintained by the community association. Um, that includes all of the financial records. They've got to be maintained for a certain period of time. Um, so those records must be in place. They should be in place. And if they're not, then certainly that's going to throw up a major red flag. Justin Clark with you on behind the law. With me, Bud941, talking to Homeowners Association, Frank Ruggieri. We're talking about HOAs. HOAs are is certainly a love-hate relationship. As homeowners, if you're not on the board, there's a love-hate relationship. And there's no doubt about it. We want to have the beautiful grass in the neighborhood. We want to have the sidewalks clean and clear. But then we also don't want to be harassed either. So it's it's finding this happy balance of living in a community and, and enjoying the, the niceties of the community. Right but also trying to avoid the, the fight with the, the old retired guy going around taking pictures of your house and, and uh, harassing you. I mean, really, that's what it, it's trying to find this happy balance of, of living in a beautiful neighborhood, uh, but not being harassed as well. A question that I get a lot in my office, Frank, and maybe you can help me with this one. So let's say I live in a condominium, right? And I live on the third floor. And then there's a fourth floor above me. And the fourth floor guy, the idiot, lets his bathtub run and it overflows. <laughs> And it floods my unit on the third floor. People come in, they say, who do I sue? Is this the HOA's responsibility? Do I sue the guy above me? Now the fourth floor guy saying, it's not my responsibility, it's the condo's responsibility. You must see the situation. Who wins in that I live below you and my unit got flooded debate? Well, look, um, I, I think when you live in a condominium, what you've got to understand is that the association has responsibility for uh, what's referred to as the common elements or common areas of the condominium, and that includes the structural portions of the building. But when you're talking about a, 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 a leak-type situation, which happens all the time, and I very often see them either related to an air conditioning unit, maybe that's a common one, or a water heater, that's a common one. Yeah. Well, guess what? The unit owner in a condominium is responsible to maintain both of those things. If the water heater goes in a condominium, typically uh, in most circumstances, um, the unit owner is going to be going to be responsible for that water heater. If it's the air conditioner, again, very common for the unit owner be, to be responsible for that. So many times in these situations where I've seen floods or even 
for example, with the bathtub, maybe an issue with the tub that leads to the leak. A lot of times that's going to be that that upstairs unit owner's responsibility. So the HO in that situation, is the homeowners association responsible for anything at all, really? Or it's it all goes against the insurance company. Hopefully they have it on the guy up top. Well, yeah, uh, look, there can absolutely be liability on the part of the condominium association in, in situations like that, because sometimes uh, what's referred to as the common elements might be the source of the problem. Maybe there's a maintenance issue, or maybe the association may have been aware of an issue mm-hmm. before it got to that point and led to that leak. So, What about the bad pipes in the wall? You know, the, the these uh, vinyl, I, I don't know what the material is. Yeah, the crappy pipe. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that that's one. The crappy pipe, Frank. Yeah. Well, how about those? <laughs> yeah, I, I, wanted, I just that. wanted to officialize things I for ran into Mick. That I'm trying to help Mick here. 30 years yeah. ago in a condo. And uh, actually, I had to just, you know, the pipes are the responsibility of the homeowners. However, repairing the wall is another thing. That's me. Right. I, had to, I had to pay all that. Yeah, no, and, and and a lot of times in condominiums in particular, these these issues of maintenance or who's responsible to repair certain things, they can become muddy, and sometimes, or many times, both the unit owner and the condominium association can have a responsibility. So, for example, uh, in Mick's, uh, Mick's situation where he had a, uh, a flood that was caused by a— uh, By bad pipes. A, a pipe that was Leaky. his responsibility. But the drywall was damaged, and, and maybe that was the association's responsibility. I well, don't know. No, I think it was the other way around. Oh, the other way around. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in a, so in a, in a situation like that, let's just say that a pipe leaks, and uh, there's really no evidence of negligence. It just happens. Sometimes yeah. it just happens. You get a pipe leak, yeah, right? Yeah, well, yeah, bad material. Um, yeah. In, in a situation like that, nobody's really at fault there. Uh, the association's going to have to fix the pipe. That's their responsibility. That's the common element. But the drywall... Uh, in your situation, That's Mick me. fell on you, yep. uh, and maybe you were even negligent, and you just didn't admit it or something. But uh, <laughs> oh, I couldn't do that. No, I wouldn't be doing. No. But uh, so, and then Mick would be responsible to fix the drywall in that situation. The homeowners association that you live in uh, is saying that you owe them five hundred dollars, and now the five hundred dollars is five thousand dollars. What are your options when that amount explodes on you? Right on the other side of this break. Justin Clark with you, Bud 941. Welcome back to the program. Justin Clark with you on Behind the Law. I'm Bud, 941-321-282-1055, www.youhavepower.com. You can watch the show live on social media at ATTY Justin Clark. We're talking to my good friend and uh, probably one of the best homeowners association attorneys in town. And when I say HOA attorneys, I don't mean representing the consumer. I mean representing the actual associations themselves. The bad guys. So, well, you know, it depends on what room you're in, I guess. But only, uh, I'm only half kidding. But we really wanted to get in the brain of, of the HOA, you know, and, and see what's really going on. Because I know a lot of you have had problems with your homeowners association before. We know that. We I hear about it all, all the time. So I really wanted to hear Frank's perspective from their side as well. And and this is something that does happen a lot, Frank, and, and you see it. So someone maybe says, look, I paid my HOA due last quarter. 300 bucks, and I pay 300 bucks a quarter for my homeowners association dues. And I paid it, but the HOA is still saying I owe it. And now, instead of 300, I owe $3,000. This is something I see in my office all the time. How much can they legally charge on penalties, interest, that sort of thing? Do you know what's legal? How, how much can they really charge me if I, if I get behind or they say I'm behind? Right. Well, let's start with uh, with interest. Right. Um, by statute, if the documents are silent, if the governing documents, remember I mentioned that in the beginning, the governing yep. documents that establish the community and uh, give the association its authority. If those documents don't address how much interest the association can charge, by law, they can uh, charge up to 18%. So you've got to be concerned with the interest they're accumulating. Um, now, second, late fees. Uh, certainly, I would encourage homeowners that might be uh, might be in the situation to take a look at whether the documents even permit late fees because they don't. Not all of them do, um, so you've got to be mindful of that. Mm. Uh, that can accumulate as well, and that can add uh, that can add up. So, um, 
And the way that a payment might be applied, that's another way, Justin, that I see where maybe some homeowners get into trouble is uh, the statute says we apply payments a certain way. So if you make a payment after the accounts become delinquent, it's going to get applied to the interest and the late fees first. Well, that means the assessments are last, and now more interest and late fees are accumulating on top of those that are coming due after. So it can become a it can kind of snowball into a into a bad situation there. Yeah, and it happens quickly. And again, if if you don't pay the HOA dues, they can foreclose on you just like a bank. But they foreclose on you faster because they use talented local attorneys like Frank Ruggieri to come essentially. I mean, it foreclose on. You. I mean, that that's the I way you guys get paid. And here's a little secret, and a lot of people don't know this. So. <laughs> There's this whole this whole vulture scheme of, of investors out there, and all they do is go around from courthouse to courthouse buying up HOA foreclosures, right? I mean, there's a whole group of investors that all they do is go around looking to buy HOA foreclosures. What, it doesn't matter if there's a mortgage or what. It, it doesn't matter because what they try to do is they, they pay 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand, or whatever it is to where the HOA gets paid off. Now the investor owns the property, kicks out the homeowner, and then rents the property until the bank comes and forecloses. So <laughs> it's even better if you're current on your mortgage because they kick you out, and now it's going to take the mortgage company three years to actually foreclose. Now I'm going to rent the house for three years, make up the money from the HOA foreclosure sale. There's a whole group of investors that do this. Yeah. I mean, if your HOA, I can almost guarantee you, if your HOA forecloses on you, there's going to be a third party come in and bid on this property, and they're going to get it, and they're going to kick you out. Whereas if the bank forecloses on you, it goes back to the bank, you know, for a hundred bucks. But if the HOA forecloses on you, it's going to happen faster, and a third party is going to buy it, and a third party is going to kick you out. No, no doubt about it. I mean, that's just how it works, right? right. And it's got to be sad from your perspective when you see this, because yeah. for some people, when you have to foreclose on them, it's not sad for you. But for some people, when you see that something just weird happened, it's yeah. got to make you feel not great, I guess, right? I mean, how do you handle that emotionally, and how do you actually deal with the homeowner when you get to that situation? Uh, you know, look, unfortunately, I've had to deal with some situations that were extremely unpleasant. Uh, I mean, I mm -hmm. had a situation one time with an elderly woman that was suffering from Alzheimer's, uh, and the family wasn't very close to her, um, and had a situation there. And when we got to the end of that process... Um, you know, I spoke to the family members and, and um, certainly could not give them legal advice, obviously, but um, I, I, I certainly laid out the reality of the situation and, and kind of gave them some nuts and bolts of uh, what they could expect and, and what the, the, the process entails and how they might be able to address it and, 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 save and, it. and straighten the situation out. And they did. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I've seen situations like that that are extremely unfortunate. It seems to me there are three people driving the train or, or having the possibility of driving the train from the HOA perspective. We've got the board, but it seems like most of the time we have a management company as well. Right. And then uh, we have the law firm. That's the, right. I mean, what percentage of these HOAs have a management company who's actually driving the train, would you say? Ooh, and, I would. I mean, it doesn't have to be an exact number. Right. Is it like half and half or is it like the vast majority of them have a management company? Oh, I would say it's closer to 75, 80 percent. Have a management a, company. A good, the good bulk of them do, yes. So then when there's a management company involved, is it really the management company typically driving the train making the decision or is it actually, you know, Joe homeowner who ran for president? Um, you know, look, the, the, the board is going to rely on the management company to take kind of the weight off their shoulders uh, and, 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 and mm. handle the bulk of the responsibilities. The board members have full-time jobs and families, et cetera. So that, that's why they retain the management company primarily to begin with. Um, but ultimately, the board's got to develop those policies. And, and most management companies that I work with, um, they're very uh, big on um, having the board adopt policies that tell them what to do in, in situations where a homeowner's delinquent or not maintaining the property and things like that. So, right. and, and they don't the documents don't always address that because at that time they didn't know if they were going to have a management company or not. So, that's, yeah. so you got to kind of like mend them together. Yeah, no. And, and, and that's it's why, I mean, you page. mentioned that Mick, I mean, that's true. I mean, a lot of the documents don't properly anticipate everything that a homeowners association is going to have to deal with. Mm. So those policies and things that the board has to put in place are, update, are important. Right? Yeah. I got to keep it updated. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I know. How often would you say that in a foreclosure case, if you guys have to foreclose on a homeowner, that a third party investor really does, like I was talking about earlier, really does come in and buy the place? I mean, it's a lot, right? Well, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned that, Justin, because not only are you correct, but that that problem has actually gotten worse. Uh, if you know, if you want to call it that, that's or at least maybe to say it this way, it's become more common. 
Um, I would actually say in, in situations that, I, that I've seen over the years and especially over the last five to six years since the foreclosure crisis got worse and started to unwind, um, I would say uh, probably 50%. Yeah. 50% will end Jeez. up going to investors. And it's funny. I mean, I've even I, – I recognize some of these names, uh, oh, yeah. you know, something, something, LLC and whatnot. And, you know, they're here. They're over in Tampa. They're over in Bavard County. And, yeah. My current board has gone rogue, right? We, uh, I think that they have mental health issues because no, this board, is, happen, so, this board is so stupid. <laughs> and I'm not talking about me, really. But I, we, we all want to rise up because we hate this board, right? It, and all the homeowners have uh, banded <clears throat> together, and now we want to do something. If a board really does go crazy in Haywire, do the other homeowners have an option? I mean, can they, can they set a vote? I mean, what, what are the options for homeowners when they really do have a board that's doing crazy things? Look, I, I always say that the best option for homeowners um, is a, the political solution. Uh, uh, um, it's the, the, the solution to the problem in a situation like that is always to get the voice of the community heard on the board. If the board members are not properly representing the sentiment of the community and what the community believes is important, um, then it's incumbent upon the homeowners to take control of that situation and, and change the composition of the board. Uh, every homeowners association by statute and condominium association must have an annual meeting every year. Um, that's where that election is going to take place. So find out about that. Get information. Don't just throw that letter away from the association. Find out when the meeting is going to be. Attend the meeting. Mm -hmm. Get involved. Get on the board. So is it always once a year for these meetings or the, the voting for the board? Do they have to do it once a year? Yes. Uh, they're required to have an annual meeting. They're and required could you have a special vote? I mean, anything's yes. possible, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, you know, maybe yeah. uh, give uh, Justin too much ammunition here, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, look, there, there's, there is a method in the statute to recall board members, so you can pursue that process of recalling. But that's going to cost you money. Uh, no, it, no, not really, Mick. Really? Uh, no, I mean, homeowners, the statute talks about how to conduct a recall, um, so that, that process is out there. Now, look, it takes a majority of the community to, to make that happen, as it Rightly, it shouldn't, in my humble opinion. Um, but there's a process in place there. So that's not something you don't even have to wait for the annual meeting. You know? What comprises a board? I mean, does a board have to have a president, a treasurer, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, is there, are there certain Officers. offices that have to be there? Yes. Okay. Yes. And we've got to have a president, uh, treasurer, secretary. Um, so you've got to have those, those, those principal offices uh, or officers, if you will, in place. Yes. Right, let's talk about estoppel fees for a minute. I get I, complaints on this all the time, too. So if you ever go buy a house, guys, and you go to the title company and they say, okay, we got everything we need here except the estoppel from the HOA, and they want $1,000. The estoppel essentially is something from the homeowners association saying that the, the, the prior owner is all good. You know, they're current on their fees they're, and there are no issues. You got to get the HOA estoppel. But it seems to me that there are places, home, some homeowners associations that I've seen, for well, number one, hold up a closing and take way, way too long to get us out of stop, or two, charge an absurd amount of money. Are there any rules on what you can charge and how long they have to get us out of stop? Absolutely. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's a great point, Justin. Just got... Uh, the new statute adopted, uh, I want to say, a year or two ago on estoppel certificates. So now we've got a, a statute that specifically addresses these estoppel certificates for condominium associations, for homeowners associations, for cooperative associations. Uh, there is a statutory um, scheme in place there that provides for a level of what those fees can be, and they cannot exceed that. Uh, they can be higher if the homeowner is delinquent, and they can also be higher if you need it on a rush basis, which is defined as three days or less. Um, so the association can charge more. But again, that's there's a schedule of those fees in the statute now, and there's also a time frame. So it's got to be provided within 10 days of receipt okay. of the request. Gotcha. You know, Justin, I thought estoppel was a line of clothing. Yeah, I think it I is mean, too. <laughs> you know? I've never Only heard that word, actually. Estoppel? Estoppel, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason for you to unless you had to go through three years of law school. You know what I mean? Yeah, I didn't do that. Speaking of law school, people think that mm. as lawyers we sort of specialize in, in an area of law and law school, but what I find is most lawyers sort of fall into what they f fall into. I, I don't, it's rare I see someone say, oh, I'm going to be a... The, HOA lawyer when I got out of school, we kind of fall into it. How did, how did you become involved in representing homeowners associations? Right. Well, now, um, when I first got out of law school, I, I 
uh, I guess you could say that I was I was kind of in the personal injury realm. Um, I did it on the plaintiff side a little bit. I did it on the defense side some. Um, just found out that it really wasn't my cup of tea. Um, so I started looking for um, a position with a firm um, that uh, you know did maybe real estate, commercial law, some different things like that. Um, and got an opportunity with a firm that specializes in community associations. Uh, uh, found out that it's really more corporate and real estate law. That's really what it's about. Yep. Um, and got that opportunity. And and first time I went to a meeting, I you know I have a great time. I, that's really what I enjoy most is going to those meetings. I love it. <laughs> you want to put a shed in your backyard and you want to paint your house this weekend. Do you need approval from your homeowners association? Right on the other side of this break, Justin Clark with you on Bud 94.1. Welcome back for another half hour of Behind the Law with me, attorney Justin Clark on Bud 941. Any legal questions you may have, 321-282-1055. The website, www.youhavepower.com. You can watch the show live on Facebook or any social media platform at ATTY. Justin Clark joining me as always, my good friend, and Orlando radio legend Mick Dolan. You know, every time we have a guest in here, they always say, Man, I've, I've, I've been listening to you for years. <laughs> yeah, right? I like that. Everybody knows Mick Dolan. Skid, you found that? Skid's here. Yeah, because they, they always say, who, who are you, Skid? <laughs> no, they don't. That's and not they, even and right. And they just look right at Mick. They're like, oh, Mick. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's okay. Come I'll be over on. here. He just, he's just lovable, isn't yes, he, Skid? Yes, he certainly is. He really is. He's just a lovable man. I've yeah. never been called lovable. No? Sorry. <laughs> not, by, not by any not of your mates. Not even by my wife, No. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, so a good friend of mine's joining us today. He's a homeowners association attorney. He represents your homeowners association. His name is Frank Ruggieri, the Ruggieri Law Firm. How do people reach out to you? If, if I'm, let's say, I'm on a board or I'm a management company, I want to reach out and have questions for you, or I want to consider changing attorneys. How do I find out more information about you? Oh well, absolutely. Well, I'd say the best uh, way, as with many businesses nowadays, is our website. Uh, that you can find us at www.ruggierilawfirm.com. Um, we've got the offices in Orlando and in Melbourne and, uh, hopefully more soon. Uh, but that's probably the best way is our website. So a question we get all the time here on the show is I painted my house the other day and all of a sudden I got a nasty gram from the president of the HOA telling me I need to repaint said house. Whoops. What is an ARB board or whatever they're called? I call them ARB boards. There's probably a more fancy name for them. And, and what do you have to do as a homeowner to get approval to do things like paint or construction or additions or a shed in the back? What do I need to do to get permission? Right. Well, in, in most communities, uh, Justin, it's it's a simple application process. Uh, and more and more nowadays, too, you know, going electronic and websites and whatnot. Uh, a lot of community associations, homeowners associations, they have their own websites. And you can... Uh, obtain uh, those architectural review forms uh, a lot of times from the community's website uh, or contact information uh, a lot of times is available for the management company that manages the community and and get that application that way but it's it's you, usually you, a simple application process you know in the, in the case of painting it's an arbitrary thing all right that color might look good to you and maybe other people but the homeowner one guy just decides oh man I don't know about that <laughs> so now what do you do well, I mean, can you, <laughs> hey, this purple is not that bad. You right. know what I'm saying? Uh, well, you know, look, certainly, Mick, there's, there's, um, uh, it, it's, it's really not a good idea for a homeowners association to rely on, on kind of, uh, the individual judgment of, of just the architectural review committee. Yeah, but that uh, happens all the time. The, I'm well, sorry. Um, <laughs> many times what you'll see, though, and, and, and what I recommend that my clients do is adopt guidelines. Um, so, for example, let's just take colors. Many communities have a palette of pre-approved colors, and the homeowner wants to paint something, and they go in and, and pick, pick. take a, As long as they pick that color, that's you're okay. Exact, that's exactly they right. They don't have to get permission because it's in there. It's like that color is there. 
So well, it depends. I don't want to give people uh, bad oh. guidance on that, but oh, okay. uh, you still may have to apply, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> even, especially if I'm the association's attorney, Mick. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have I a ca- I have a case now where my client built an addition, <clears throat> and the addition cost eighty thousand dollars, and it's a beautiful addition. You're not involved in the case, I promise. And they are absolutely, uh, they, they are absolutely, I kind of wish you were, they are absolutely forcing my client to remove the addition because they did not get permission from the ARB board prior to putting up. And then the argument from my client is always, that one has that addition, that one has that addition, that one has same exact ad- addition, but you're picking on me. And it also leads to the, the age old question as well. Well, I have a dog. Where I know dogs aren't allowed in the community, but she has a dog, he has a dog, <laughs> she has a dog, yeah, really. but you're, you're picking on me. So it's this selective enforcement thing. Help us understand why I feel like the HOA is picking on me when my neighbor has the same addition or my neighbor has the same size dog. How does that work in the HOA world? Well, I mean, what you have to, I think what homeowners have to understand in these situations, Justin, is a lot of times if you do see other um, properties in the community that may have a similar modification to what you would like to put in um, and you're upset that the association's pursuing you, it may very well be the case that they're also pursuing those other homeowners and you just don't know. Um, and uh, especially depending on where they are, they might be in the process. So you know, don't rush to judgment or, or think right away that, that they're not taking action as to those other homeowners. That's that's number one. They've been, they may be very early on in the process. You wouldn't have any kind of lawsuit that you could see in the public records or anything. So uh, that could certainly be the case. Um, but sometimes you're right. I mean, it may be a situation where not they may not be picking on it, but maybe they just don't know. They're not aware of that other property. That might be another uh, another issue that another explanation, if you will. So you could get your neighbors in trouble all over. <laughs> that's exactly yeah, that's exactly right, and, and 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 you probably should, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, an honest lawyer. I gotta love that. <laughs> have, have you ever seen a homeowners association just legit run out of money? Like we just don't have any money left. Oh, absolutely. I had one community in particular. It was a condominium, Justin. And as you know, condominiums can, uh, they have to uh, have reserves to save money for large expenditures, replacing things, you know, <coughs> uh, doing damage. roofs and things oh, like that. Yeah. Uh, and I had a community that they, that kept waiving these reserves every year. So they were not saving that money. Well, they kept doing it for over a decade. And eventually, yeah, they ended up in bankruptcy. Yes. And how so do they then do- what happens? Then, 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 you know, your HOA goes bankrupt. Yeah, that's right. Then we'll- so now what? Well, um, you your know, grass gets really high. Hey, lo- lo- <laughs> well, local government might not, might, might not like me saying this, Mick, but uh, to right. be honest with you, what typically happens, what may happen in situations like this where you just have a community that goes bankrupt, we've got one in particular that's been on the news a lot, um, and uh, sometimes the county and local government may have to step in and take on the responsibility yeah. uh, of of some of those responsibilities that the association used to take care of. Wow. Behind the law with me, attorney Justin Clark on Bud 94.1. We're talking to Homeowners Association attorney Frank Ruggieri. He represents homeowners associations throughout Central Florida, and we're trying to get some uh, get some down low from him on what's really going on behind the scenes with, <laughs> with these people driving around taking pictures of your house. <laughs> <laughs> they have but good we, cameras. But so one of the things that really upsets people often is the, the nasty word uh, of assessment. Right, yeah. right. So I'm paying my HOA fee every month. It's four hundred dollars a month. That, that should be plenty. Now all of a sudden, I get this letter saying I owe four thousand dollars. Explain this assessment process. How does a, a, an HOA determine how much to assess? What's it for? I mean, there's got to be a process for this. Is it, is it just an arbitrary number they throw out? They want four grand from me. How right. does it work? Right. Well, look, um, I, I think it might be helpful uh, for folks to maybe think of it. It's kind of like taxes. It's kind of like property taxes or you know taxes that we pay to the federal government. Um, uh, that association has certain responsibilities that it's got to take care of. I mean, if you look at, again, going back to the governing documents for the community, the association has certain responsibilities. It's got to maintain common areas and do other things. Uh, so it's got to have a way to, to, to fund those responsibilities, and they do it through assessments. Now, how do they come up with that number? No, it shouldn't be arbitrary. Uh, again, going back to what I mentioned about asking to look at those official records, uh, the budgets for the, the community are going to be in those official records, so take a look at them. That's where those numbers are coming from. That's how the association determines, hey, we need X amount to, to pay our bills every year, and you divide that up amongst our you know 100 or whatever uh, homeowners we got, and there's your assessment. 
hurricane damage. So we had a big hurricane come through here, uh, what, six, seven months ago? Uh, I have no idea. When we, It's been a while now, it's huh? Been a while. It was last summer, yeah. Yeah, last summer. Don't uh, remind me. <laughs> it, it worked out well for me. You guys had more trouble than I did. Oh, yeah. buddy. It was uh, you had no AC in here for like a week. I remember. Yeah, we had electric studio. here. For oh yeah, yeah that was was awesome. always great doing radio with no electricity in the middle of the in summer. The sure. You got to talk loud. <laughs> a radio station with no electricity. <laughs> yeah, that's always good. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> breaker, breaker, one nine. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how do you communicate yeah, with the public when all, you're on all CB on you. <laughs> Talking like trucker talk. So yeah. anyway, so you got you have a hurricane roll through a community, right? This is not a let's say it's not a condominium community. But it's uh, it's homes, right? These are single family residential homes. The hurricane just sort of trashes the community. Most of the houses survive. There's some roof damage, but the fences, the the community fences are all screwed up. The playground is screwed up. The HOAs have insurance for this type of situation. Are you going to assess me as a homeowner? Well, you know, look, they they should have insurance. Um, uh, Sometimes I guess there could be situations, I haven't seen many, but there can be situations where a community simply doesn't have insurance. Or uh, maybe even worse, they're, they're, maybe they're not, not actively managed or whatnot and they, they miss the, uh, the deadline and all of a sudden the policy expires and they don't even know it and they don't have coverage. Um, so I've seen it happen. But yes, most homeowners associations, most community associations do have insurance that would insure the common areas and protect against uh, those kinds of uh, damages. But are they required? To have it, um, yes, uh, that's the question. Well, uh, yes, they, they technically they are sort yes. of yes. Yeah. All right, so it's a condominium complex that I live in now. I, I, I've downgraded from my single family home. Now I live in a condo complex. It's uh, twenty stories tall. Let's say hurricane comes through, blows my doors in. Right? How do we determine what's my responsibility versus what the homeowners association responsibility is? Right. Well, when we're talking about a condominium. Um, Again, I'm going to use that phrase again, the governing documents. Take a look at those documents. Take a look at the declaration, what's called the Declaration of Condominium. That's where you're going to see what I call the unit boundaries. And that's going to talk about, hey, what are literally the physical boundaries of my condominium unit, typically the unfinished drywall and flooring and right. ceiling right. inwards, your inner living space, essentially, Um and typically the association, uh, the common elements is everything outside of that, the load-bearing walls, the roofs, et, et cetera. Well, no, back to the apartment, your responsibility. What about the windows and the door? A lot of times in a condominium, the uh, excellent question, Mick. Uh, a lot of times in a condominium, the doors and windows will be unit owner responsibility. But that can be dictated by the individual set of documents in the condominium that you're, that you're dealing with. Wow. You have fallen behind on your HOA dues, and you're getting letters from from the HOA or from their lawyer what is the best way to resolve your past due homeowners association dues one more segment ahead Justin Clark with you behind the law bud 941. One more segment ahead. Thank you for joining me. I hope you have a fantastic weekend in store. My name is Justin Clark. If you have any legal questions whatsoever, the phone number, 321-282-1055. The website, www.youhavepower.com. Joining me is Frank Ruggieri from the Ruggieri Law Firm. He represents HOAs across Florida. I mean, he's kind of on the other side. I mean, we're sharing a room here, he's, but he's a great guy. And I enjoy working with him, but we're, we're clearly on the other side of the table. We and understand not, that. He's and not armed. I either. hope we haven't been too rough on you today by any means. You kind of came into our house, but we're trying to be nice, right? 
Well, I mean, once I got the potato sack off my head that you, that, that you guys put on me when I walked in the door, Justin, and then, uh, you know, the, or, the oranges, the uh, bags of oranges. It was for your own safety. Like I said earlier in the show, most people, it strikes me that most people don't understand if you don't pay your homeowners association, they can come foreclose on your home just like Bank of America can. But they can come foreclose on your home faster than Bank of America can, and it's always going to go to a third, most of the time it's going to go to a third party investor who's going to buy it and they're going to kick you out of your house immediately. So be very, very, very careful when it comes to paying HOA dues. When someone comes in my office and they're doing very poorly financially, it goes like this. Make sure your family has food. Make sure your HOA is paid. Those are the two people I want to pay first because the HOA has more power and they're going to take your house faster than Bank of America. Always pay the HOA before you pay Bank of America. That's just that's just the reality of the situation. Really? Eat food, HOA second. <laughs> Seriously, it, it, it's like that. But many times people will come in my office and say, look, we had some kind of dispute and now the Homeowners Association is saying I owe $1,000. And then we have penalties and we have interest and then they have to start adding the attorney's fees to it as well. So $300 very quickly becomes $3,000. 3000 very quickly becomes ten grand. I mean, it really adds up quickly. I mean, I know you guys have to get paid and they have to get paid by the person who's not paying them, okay? So they add up quickly and they always say, well, what should I do? I don't have ten grand to pay. So, I mean, one of the things I will say, and if it's already gone to a law firm, right? I will say, look, maybe shoot an email you know, to, to the law firm or to the paralegal who sent you a letter and just say, look, I'm struggling. Yeah. I know you're a, saying I owe ten grand. Heart. I mean, what kind of options do I have? Because, I mean, you guys are busy, too. I mean, you get a lot of phone calls from disgruntled homeowners. What do you find the most effective way when someone doesn't have a lawyer, when they just reach out directly to you to try to resolve the debt? What's the most effective way to get to you guys? Um, you know, look, uh, we're very responsive. Um, you know, I take what we do very, very seriously, and and my obligation is to the entire community. It's not to a, a board of directors. It's, it's to every homeowner in that community. I'm, I'm representing all of those homeowners, uh, and I want to work with those homeowners. So uh, we have email information in all of our correspondence. We have it on our website. We have phone numbers, obviously, for the for the office where you can reach us. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, shoot an email. Email is certainly very effective, and it's quick. What are typical? Uh, all right, so a lot of people don't. Most people don't have ten grand sitting around. Right. They get behind. They just don't. I mean, I think the vast majority of people, even at retirement, only have like ten or twenty grand in their bank account. So people, generally speaking, don't have ten thousand dollars to just stroke a check to the HOA for whatever reason. They got behind. What sort of payment options will an HOA generally allow to bring someone current? And I know it varies. I'm just right. trying to get an idea for people out there listening. Look, um, the number one thing that I want to encourage people, Justin, with when it comes to a delinquency, okay, uh, because that's kind of maybe the com most common issue, right, that we run into with homeowners and homeowners associations, um, get on top of the problem early. It doesn't matter that you're not in a position, perhaps financially, but we've all been there. Um, we've all been in, in financial situations, you know, me with student loans when I got out of law school. Um, so... Uh, the important part, reach out to the association, go to the board meeting, talk to the board early. Don't ignore those early letters that you get to the, from the management company before it gets to yeah. the law firm because that's when things are really going to start adding up. Yeah. Um, so I encourage homeowners to reach out quickly. Don't, uh, don't ignore those letters. Uh, reach out uh, early. Um, and most of my clients are very open to, um, to payment plans and, and settlements that provide for a time to repay the debt. Um, so, you know, I see very common, maybe a year, up to a year, 12 months. That's kind of a common time frame. All right. So the HOA is saying I owe them money. Okay. So I'm getting a letter from the homeowners association, but then I call my neighbor who's on the board and he says, I need to call Janice from Century Management. Right. Who do I, am I talking to the management company? Am I talking to the HOA? I mean, who, who am I really dealing with here normally? Okay. Well, you before know, it gets to the law firm, I've got a management company and I have a board and I've got a treasurer and I have the president. Then I have also the, the person at the front gate. I mean, who do I really talk to, to try to resolve this thing? Right. In most instances, like we said uh, early on, the vast majority of the communities that I represent have professional management. They have management companies. Um, and the association is going to have contact information, you know, through the, uh, through the association itself, through their websites, 
um, find out what that is. In most instances, though, it's the management company before it gets to my office. Um, so, so that's going the to be ones the, that you need to go to. Yes, and and a lot of look those those managers. I, I I work with them and have been working with them for twenty years. They're they are they are responsive. Uh, send them an email if it's not gotten to the point where it's been turned over to legal counsel. Um, the management company will be very responsive. They'll get back to you and 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 work with you on getting something taken. Uh, getting something worked out. Bankruptcy is a tool we have to use sometimes to deal with homeowners associations. Um, and you know, like I've told you before, if you do file chapter 13, you can pay them over time, pay them over five years, but the HOA is, is going to get paid, but over five years. Now, if the first mortgage is underwater, we can oftentimes strip, and he doesn't want to hear this, but we can strip away the HOA fees through the chapter 13 bankruptcy if you can prove that your first mortgage is underwater. But here's the question for you. So there was a time, guys, for about a two-year little period where, for whatever reason, we had some weird case only in this district for bankruptcy. Nationwide, you couldn't do it, but where you could strip away a second mortgage in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, which is the really easy, you know, boom, boom, boom bankruptcy. Oh. We all knew it was going to go away, but there was like a two-year period where you could strip away a second mortgage, which really includes a homeowners association lien in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. When that case first came out, my friends who, who were working for HOAs were like, dude, I mean, what is going on here? I mean, that had to, was that a, a kind of a scary time when that was going on? Were the HOAs a little bit nervous? I mean, it was a crazy case, you know, and we, right. we all knew it wasn't going to last right. forever, but I mean, that was kind of a big deal for HOAs, right? Yeah, now look, um, I certainly, uh, it, it, it might not seem that way, but I absolutely sympathize with the, the situations of those individual homeowners. At the same time, look, the community's got bills to pay. They've got responsibility. They've got things that they've got to take care of. So when you've got that situation like that where the association is facing uh, the potential mm -hmm. of just losing out completely on on collecting that amount, so yeah, it's absolutely a, a was not a fun time. Did you find, I mean, did, did you actually see the bottom line on some of these HOAs really be affected by that law? Or no? Uh, probably not no. significantly because I, I think most homeowners are very, very hesitant to, to, to take that final step of going through bankruptcy. Yeah, gotcha. It was a crazy time. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I didn't even hear about that. that yeah, was, so, and it, but it was only here, really. It was only in this sort of district for bankruptcy. Across really? the country, you never could do it. It was pretty well settled that you couldn't strip a second mortgage in a Chapter 7, but then we had this case come through where you could. That is not the law of the land now. You cannot strip a second mortgage or a lien by filing a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. You can in a 13, but certainly not in a in a Chapter 7. Craziest things, you must have seen some real drama. I mean, you must have seen some real drama with these HOAs. I mean, who's normally the more emotionally charged person here? Is it the homeowner? Is it the people on the board? Is it the management company? Who, who do you really see the most emotional charge out of? Um, you know, look, I, I think in most instances, it's going to be the homeowner, um, at least initially. Um, but you've got to understand, I, there's a misconception. I call it um, kind of the apartment complex uh, uh, mentality almost, where many homeowners see the association as kind of this management thing that's out there. There's, they're, they're, all, they're like as if they own all of the, the homes and they're renting them out. <laughs> uh, that's not the case. I mean, it, those are your neighbors. Um, really? So... Uh, a lot of times I kind of see equal emotion on both sides and uh, uh, board members being upset that the homeowner is, is putting them through this and yeah. showing up at their meetings and yelling at them and things like that. When being they, a thorn they in the side. They don't feel such, that that's yeah. fair. I mean, they, they've got their own perspective on it. If I Let's say I'm a pissed off homeowner and I go to one of these meetings. Do I have a right to talk? Does everyone have a right to say something or do I have to get on the agenda? How does that work? Well, as long as I'm not present. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I, understood. No, I'm kidding. No, absolutely, uh, yes. Uh, all homeowners have a right to address what are called the items on the agenda. So in other words, what's the, uh, what's the outline of issues that the board's going to address that night? Uh, what's on their agenda that night? You've got a right to talk to address each of those items that, that's on there. And do most of these HOAs have a, a monthly meeting? Is it just once a year? What's the typical amount of meetings they have per year? Most homeowners associations and condominium associations meet monthly. Okay. Uh, the next most common is quarterly, and unfortunately, I've got a couple that try to push it out beyond that and only meet twice a year or once a year, and that's not good. So I'll be totally honest with you here. Um, I have, like, a life and stuff, so I haven't been to one of these meetings before. <laughs> never. Uh, I've owned plenty of places at HOA, within HOA. I've literally never been to a meeting. 
What goes on? Tell me how. What really goes on at this? So everyone sits down. I, I, my vision is like these little, very uncomfortable folding uh, chairs. You yeah. know what I mean? The aluminum folding chairs. You like get them all school out. Classroom. Everyone's like there, and you know we got these buddies over here. We got this click over here. <laughs> We're all sitting on. Op- what? What really? Describe one of these meetings. What, what room do they take place in, and how do they really go? Well, look. I, yeah, that's kind of funny. Just and it's almost a, a little bit of a. Enter- I was right. Entertaining oh. part of what I do as okay. far as. Because, look, I've done these meetings everywhere from the employee lounge of a Publix to uh, <laughs> to a library or, or some other place like that. So the <laughs> you're talking about a nice uh, wide variety. Yeah. but you Out know. by the pool, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you you know, look, it's a Twin lot of, Peaks. <laughs> yeah, there you, go. there you go. No, a lot of times it's a community facility. It's a clubhouse. Uh, sometimes it can be a board member's home. Um, but, uh, there's a lot of local facilities, public libraries, things like that, that will make their churches, that will make their uh, r- rooms available for, for the, for a homeowner's All right. So we all get there and then we have the board like up on a pedestal here on, with their own table and then everyone else is in the, the uncomfortable chairs. How does it work? Um, well, a lot of times if I'm at the meeting, I'll have the, the homeowner shackled. Uh, <laughs> no, good. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's very informal. I mean, you may have an area where the board is sitting. Sometimes they'll have a, you know, maybe a table, but I, I tell my, I tell my boards too, you've got to be careful with that. Okay. Because if you're setting up a table and then you've got the board members that are sitting behind the table and everybody's over here, you're kind of creating separation between the homeowners and the board that, because uh, can, you're supposed to be just members of the community. That's exactly that. right. Yeah. 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 So I, you know, I encourage uh, I encourage my boards to uh, uh, to try to you know sit with the homeowners like that to the extent that they can. All right. So then we sit down. The the president says oh, call to order or something like that. And, right. then, and then we have an agenda we go through. We go through a budget. What what do we go through with these meetings? Well, look. I mean, it's it's a business meeting. And and as I always tell tell folks uh, in my board member certification classes. A uh, homeowners association, a condominium association, it's not a garden club. It's a business. It's a corporation like any other. It's a not-for-profit corporation. Um, and it's got to file tax returns every year, so it's a business. When you go to the meeting, you've got to go through those formalities. Did we notice the meeting proper properly? Do what's called uh, establishing that the meeting was properly noticed. Uh, proof of notice. Establish that we've got enough folks there, whether it's a board meeting or a membership meeting. Uh, what's called a quorum. Do we have a quorum present so that we can call the meeting to order? Uh, and then we move into the agenda items, which is all the different issues that the board might want to address. Uh, so, for example, pursuing you, Justin, for a violation of the covenants. Exactly right. A- <laughs> what, running around, running around naked again. That, that uh, might I've get never you in done trouble. that. No. Well, Frank Ruggieri, I really appreciate you coming here. He's he's the preeminent, preeminent HOA attorney in town. More information about you, who they can find where www.ruggerilawfirm.com. Thanks for being here, my man. Thanks for having for me, as Mi- always. For Mick Dolan, that's Skid from our next-door neighbor, 1031 The Wolf. My name is Justin Clark, and Mick, I don't know much, but I do know one little thing. What's that? I will see you right back here next Saturday on Bud 94.1.